Amen. Amen. I know that my Redeemer lives. True enough. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. In the prayer, Brother Tony mentioned, we need you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. Every day we need the Lord. Every day we will continue to love the Lord. Where can we go but to the Lord? Because I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. A few days ago, um, the U.S. celebrated Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, and uh, we should be thankful every day. We should be grateful every day, and I would like to put up a question. Why should we be thankful, and why should we be, uh, why should we practice thankfulness and gratefulness? Okay. And uh, the answer would be, we are thankful because We've been blessed by God. Can I hear an amen? If you are blessed by God, can I hear you say amen? Amen. 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 Just right this very morning, this very morning when you all wake up, it's a blessing from God. So we are blessed by God. And by practicing thankfulness, it reminds us of how much we have. Right? When we practice gratitude every day when we practice thankfulness it keeps our focus on God's blessings on us and this reminds us that we are blessed beyond measure amen we are so blessed beyond measure and this is also a manifestation from us that we are content in all the things that we have when we continue and when we practice uttering the word thank you to God and we practice gratitude. We are telling God that we are content for all the things that we receive from Him. And whatever happens, we will remain grateful and we will forever be thankful to God. The scripture reading that we have in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay, verses 16 to 18. Again, let me read to you. Rejoice at all times. Rejoice. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in every circumstance. For what? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you will look at these verses, there is one thing that is common to them. Okay? There is one thing common amongst the verbs that are mentioned. Rejoicing, praying, and thinking. And you can see the frequency. Okay. One thing that is common to all of them is the frequency. Rejoice. The activity is rejoice. The frequency <clears throat> at all times. Right? The activity is to pray. The frequency without ceasing. Don't stop. Okay. The activity is to thank, thankfulness. It says the frequency in every circumstance. So with all of those three activities, there is one thing in common to them, the frequency of without ceasing, continually, always, in every circumstances. Okay. All of them suggest a uh, continuity. Continuity of rejoicing, continuity in praying, and continuity in thanking the Lord regardless of the situations a believer is in. We should all be rejoicing regardless of the situation. We should be prayerful regardless of the situation. We should be thankful regardless of the situation. Now, a true believer will and can rejoice even in the midst of trials you know because as uh, one 
commentary says, because that believer possesses the blessedness of forgiveness and the sure prospect of eternal life. And he has the consciousness that all things work together for good to them that love God, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Now, I want you to look at uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Not only that, but we also rejoice in what? Rejoice in our sufferings. Am I reading that correct? Can we rejoice in our sufferings? Somehow, it's hard to rejoice. But Apostle Paul tells us, Jesus, God, tells us to rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering, ah, it produces perseverance. And if you will go on reading that, uh, the following verses, it will result to a wonderful result. Okay? So we can rejoice in our sufferings. Pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us, pray without ceasing is a call for a conscious reaching out, reaching out to God, no matter what the circumstance we are in. Now, God wants us to go to Him in all the time. You know, you just come to God and lay out what your thoughts are, what your whatever, what is in your hearts. And Paul refers this to as a devotion. Okay? This kind of going to God, this kind of praying without ceasing, Paul calls that a devotion in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. When he said, devote yourselves to prayer. Okay? Pray without ceasing. That is devotion, a call towards devotion. Being watchful, and again it says, thankful. Now comes 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Okay? Which tells us to give thanks in everything. To give the Lord thankfulness in every circumstance. Now, what does that mean? Okay? Now, let us first clear the statement of Apostle Paul. He did not say, give thanks for everything. He did not say that. What he said, give thanks in everything. There's a big difference between giving thanks for everything and giving thanks in everything. So let us clear that up first. Now, Paul is not telling us to be thankful for our hardship, for our sickness. Paul is not telling me to be thankful for my heart problems, for my cancer. No. Paul is telling me, and it's, Paul is telling us in this verse that we must be thankful in the circumstance. Though I am not thankful for my heart problem, I am thankful for the circumstances that despite of my illness, despite of my ailment, God is able to sustain me every Every day. And for that, I am thankful. Amen. Amen. If everybody here, a while ago we heard from uh, Brother Kennedy, all those that needed prayer. I want you to take heart. The Lord is with you. He will fight your battle. He will go in front of you, ahead of you, beside you. He will be with you through your battle. Trust in the Lord. Okay. Apostle Paul said again, he said, give thanks in every circumstance. We are to be thankful not only in, in the pleasant times, in the pleasant situations that we are in, but we are also must be thankful to those that are unpleasant, but we deem unpleasant to all of us. Again, Romans, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3, is clear that we can rejoice in our suffering. That I can rejoice, this part of my, despite of my heart ailment, I can rejoice in my sufferings. I can rejoice in the state where I am in because I know that God is with me and that the Lord is keep on sustaining me every day. The Lord is giving me my life every day. Not that I am... Rejoice and glad that I have 
this incurable disease. No. That is not what Paul meant. Okay. He is telling us that in sufferings, that in our trials, there are still reasons to rejoice. Because if we truly belong to Christ, Romans 8.28 says, All things, they work together for what? For good. Now, what are the qualifications? It says, to those, to those what? To those who love God. For those who doesn't love God, now they will be resentful to God. They will hate God for all the unpleasantness in their life. But for those who are truly believers in God, they will rejoice in the midst of their sufferings because they know that everything will work for good because they love God and they are called according to His purpose. If you meet those criteria, then you can smile at your problem because you know that God is bigger than your problem. Okay. Now, Job is a classic example who rejoiced always, who prayed all the time, he prayed continually, and he gave thanks in all circumstances. Now, let us go to Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. He fell to the ground, and see what he did. He worshipped with all the things happened to him, despite he lost everything, even his children, he worshipped God. I want you to imagine the heart of Job. See, He worshipped God and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How can a man who lost everything, in an instant, and still say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, that is a, a man with a grateful heart, with a thankful heart. Now, in Job chapter 2, verse 10, you speak as a foolish woman speaks, referring to his wife. He told her, You should, should we accept from God? only good and not adversity. In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Job is a picture perfect of a man that possesses a grateful heart towards God. Okay. Now, as again, as we all celebrated Thanksgiving, this morning we will look into a picture of what a grateful man looks like. Okay. And we're not going to look at Job as an example. We will look to a different person, to an uh, unlikely character in the Bible as we study this lesson. Beyond thankful, a picture of a grateful man. Okay. In Luke chapter 17, verses 5, 15 to 19, this is the story about the 10 lepers that Jesus healed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has, none, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Now, we look at this particular leper and see an important lesson of what is the real meaning of gratefulness, thankfulness. You know, gratefulness is going beyond being thankful. Now, this leper goes beyond being thankful. He was grateful to God, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we saw that this leper, he went back to Jesus. But I want to make mention before the healing happens, let me take you back to the story a bit. Rewind for a bit. The healing happened when Jesus was going to Jerusalem. And, and he was, in verse 11, he was uh, waiting, uh, he was on the border of Samaria and Galilee. And you can read that in verse 11. Now going to Jerusalem, Jesus knew what's waiting for him in Jerusalem. His death. He knew that he will die. 
soon. He had a problem in his own. Okay? He had a problem going on in his mind. Now the lepers, the ten lepers saw him and they shouted at the top of their voices, Jesus, have pity on us. You know why they are shouting? Because during those times, the lepers, they were a group, they were an outcast. Okay? They were uh, secluded or and excluded from the community. Okay? And whenever they go out and people would be coming near to them, they will have to shout. They will have to shout, unclean, unclean, or leper, leper, so that the people would be aware that they are lepers. So the people would uh, uh, will have a, a, a safe distance from them. Okay? They will distance from them so that they will not be uh, get the leprosy. So they would shout. So that's why when they saw Jesus from afar, they shouted. Not unclean, but they shouted, Jesus, have pity on us. And then Jesus heard. And Jesus told them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Now turning their backs from Jesus Christ, they went to the priest and they were healed on the way to the priest. Now the question, why are they, why are they going to the priest? Because it was customary at that time that the priest is the one who will declare you if, you if you claim that you are healed from leprosy, then you have to go to the priest because the priest will be the one to declare you clean. If the priest will not declare you clean, then you will continue to be an outcast. So if the priest say that you are clean, then the community will accept you. You will be back to the community. That's why Jesus said, you go and show yourselves to the priest. So as they turned their backs from Jesus Christ, okay, they were clean. Now in 1713, look, we see that they shouted, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now on the side note, have we not in our lifetime shouted these words to God? Have we not in our lifetime begged Jesus Christ, begged God for healing? Have we not shouted to God, God, heal me. Lord, heal my loved ones. See? Now, remember, Jesus had his own problems going to, to Jerusalem, but he chose to show compassion. He chose to show pity. Not thinking of his own problem, he looked towards the leper and he had compassion on the lepers. And then Jesus told them to show themselves to the priest. Okay. Now, note that there were 10 lepers that were cleansed. But here is what get the story interesting. Only one returned to Jesus Christ out of the nine, out of the 10, sorry. Only 10%. If they could have been 20, 5% returned. So out of the 10, one returned to Jesus Christ. This one leper, he exemplified the manner in which we must show great gratitude. We will learn from this one leper the real picture of what it is to be a grateful man before God. Now, look at what this leper did. Okay. Going back again to Luke 17. Okay. He came back, praising God, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet. Now, number one, I want you to remember, remember the giver. We must be thankful to the giver. We must show our gratitude to whom? To the giver. Oftentimes, we forget about the real giver behind the blessings. If someone helped you, we are, we are so thankful to that person. Okay. We would hug that person. We would kiss that person. And we would say good things about that person. But we are forgetting one thing. We are forgetting the real giver behind that person, and that is Jesus Christ, and that is our Lord. 
Okay? We oftentimes forget who the giver really is. Thankfulness is not about you. Being grateful is not about you. Being grateful is not about even the blessings that you receive. Being grateful and being thankful, it is about God. It is about the giver. We give thanks to whom? We give thanks to God because it is all about God. In Psalm 103 verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. I would say that again. Forget not all His benefits. Forget not all the things that He did for you and I. Never forget what God has given you. Never forget all the things that He had provided all of us. You see, the leper, he remembered. He went back to Jesus. He remembered Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving is a celebration of the giver, and that is God. Thanksgiving is about God. Thankfulness is about God. It's not about me. It's not about the blessing. It's about God himself. So we remember the giver. And how do we remember God? That's the question. How do we remember God? The second thing that I want to share with you is we praise God. We praise God. But the question again, how is praising God done? And what is praise? If you will look into the meaning of the word praise, it means valuing Him for who He really is. Valuing God for who He really is. And how do we do that? First, you have to know who God is. You cannot value somebody if you don't know that somebody. Make sense? So you have to know God first before you value and before you can praise God. A person must have a clear understanding of who God is. Now this leper understood who Jesus was. That's why he came back to Jesus and that's why at the top of his voice they shouted, Jesus master have pity on us because they knew from their heart that Jesus Christ can heal them. Okay. Now there was a scenario in, in John chapter 9, when Jesus healed a, a person, a blind person, in John chapter 9, 35, 36, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Then the blind man said, Who is he, sir? Who is he? The man asked. Then he said, Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Now, to properly praise God, real belief must exist in our hearts about who God really is. We must like this blind person, truly asking who God is so that we may believe and truly praise God. Okay? Now this man, he asked Jesus Christ so that he may believe and so that he may utter proper praises to God. And it was not, and I want to, I want to believe that his inquiry is not just an ordinary inquiry just to know who God is, but a kind of inquiry that is deep, that he is truly seeking to know who God is and who is this Son of Man, so that he can truly believe in him, so that he can truly praise him. And when we value somebody, going to the definition of praise, valuing somebody, when we value somebody, it means we give high esteem to them. We give high respect to that person, to that somebody. We talk highly of them. Okay? Now, we, we value our spouses when we are loyal to them. We, we value our bosses at work when we respect them because of their authority over us. We value and respect people because of the positions they hold and for who they are in our lives. Now, we value God the same thing. We value God when we put God ahead and far higher than these people. If we are so respectful 
about our bosses at work, if we are so respectful about our spouses, then we should do all the more be respectful to God. We should be all the more highly talking about God because God created your spouse. God created your boss. God created you. So we must give high, the highest regards to God. We value God when we are far more loyal to Him. We are far more loyal to Him than we are loyal to our spouses. We value God when we give Him the highest respect that we give to our bosses at work. We value God when we recognize His absolute authority towards us. And we value God when we talk so highly about Him. When you are so proud about your children, when you are so proud about your spouse, when you are so proud about your friends, you talk highly of them, right? You, you are so proud telling other people about them. And that's how it is when you value God, when you are praising God, you should talk highly of God. Wherever you are and whomever you are with, you should be thankful to God and praising God, talking to God about not to them. And that's how, my dear brother and sisters and friends, we value and praise God. So this leper, he not only remembered Jesus Christ, he praised Jesus Christ. And then the next part is that gratitude that we can learn uh, from, uh, from this leper about gratitude is that he worshiped God. You remember God, you praise God, and you should worship God. Now, I want you to notice what the leper did. He came back, he praised God, and then he did what? He threw himself at Jesus' feet. Literally, he threw himself at Jesus' feet. At Jesus' feet. He prostrated. He went down and kissed the ground. He kissed the foot. The feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. He kissed the hem of the dress of our Lord Jesus Christ. He threw himself in worship to Jesus and to God. See? Real gratitude is about throwing yourself before God. Throwing yourself before God in all humility, bowing before Him in all reverence and in all awe because you recognize God for who he is, and that He is sovereign, and that you are not. Real gratitude is a call for worship to God. And when you worship God, you put God at the center of your heart. You put God in the spotlight. He is the, what we call the Bida. He is the main character. Okay. He is the main character. And that's what we call in Tagalog, Bida. <laughs> He's the main character, the main role. Okay. So we put God at the pedestal. We don't put ourselves in front. You put the Lord in front. And real gratitude is servitude to God. That's why beyond thankful is gratitude. It is more than uttering the word, Lord, thank you. It is more than that. It is more than remembering. It is more than praising. It is worshiping God, serving God, throwing yourself to God. That is what real gratitude looks like. Now, God knows our hearts. God knows if you are really thankful or not. God knows your intention. God knows your motive. Again, gratitude Gratitude is more than uttering the words, thank you, Lord. God demanded more from all of us. You see, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus answered, Isaiah prophesied about, correctly about you, hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts, listen, are far from me. You see, sometimes we just thank God in just a manner of, you know, lip service, as they call it. We just want to, to say and to 
for people to see that we are thankful to God. Lord, thank you. But you see, you can fool me, but you cannot fool God. Because God sees your heart. God sees the motive inside you. If you are really thankful or not, or if you are just doing it just for lip service or not. You see, many, are peop many people are praising God. Hallelujah, praise God. But you see, God can see what is in our hearts. If we are truly praising God or not. And that's why Jesus said, Isaiah was right. You hypocrites. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are truly far from me. You see, when, when, we, when we are so thankful to God, you know, this is, the type of, this is the type of things that we do. For example, we pass, a, we pass the board exam or the bar exam, the law exam, for example. And we want to thank God. We celebrate, of course. There's nothing wrong with that. But you see, the problem is, we throw what? We throw a big party. We throw a big celebration. We throw with so many booze. But where is God? And yet we call that a thanksgiving for God. But where is God? Many people do that. But as real Christians, we do not throw in a, a big party without God. Because we will throw ourselves to God rather than throw a party without God. See, when we are thankful to God, we put God at the center. When we are grateful to God, we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus Christ. If you want to celebrate, there's no problem with celebration. There's no problem with thankfulness. We'll be having a, a, a big gathering. There's no problem with that. The problem is how you, how you do it. See? We must put God in the midst of the celebration, of the thankfulness. We all celebrated Thanksgiving. We put God in the midst. God said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 20, where two or three gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. You see, gratitude, gratitude takes more than faith. It takes more than faith. The lepers had faith. When Jesus said, go, and they, they go. They had faith. But you see, only one came back. Only one showed true faith in Jesus Christ. The other nine, they never came back. Okay? And true faith is about being obedient. True faith is about remembering God. True faith is about serving our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting ourselves to God. In James chapter 2, 26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without work is dead. Our faith in God is useless without being obedient to Him. Our thanksgiving will be useless if our hearts, our whole being are not given to God. Now, I would like to follow the principle of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, when Apostle Paul said, If I speak in the tongues of men or of an angels, but, but not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, again, I would like to use this principle, and I would like to mention about this. If I utter a thousand thanksgiving, but have not God, in my life, I am only a resounding goal or a clanging symbol. I can thank God all, all I want. But if I am not praising the right way, if I am not serving the right way, then I will be useless. It will be useless. God will tell me, you are just honoring me with your lips. But I can see your heart. Your heart is miles and miles away from me. The song goes, miles away, so many miles away from me. Our heart is so miles away from God. Now, Prophet Micah understood what real gratitude looks like. Micah chapter 6, verse 7, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. 
See, Prophet Michael was asking, what can I give? Can I even give my firstborn to please God? Then he answered, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? He mentioned three things. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In 1 Samuel, the same principle. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of of the Lord. What is more important? Sacrificing or obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. You see, the act of real obedience to God is far better than any sacrifices therein or there is. Our thank you Lord, the words of thank you God, it is just the beginning. There's nothing wrong with that. It is just the beginning of showing real gratitude to God. And he demands more than that. Now, Apostle Mark, in the like manner, wrote in Mark chapter 12, verse 33, when he said, And to love him with what? With all your heart, and with all your understanding, and with all your strength. You see, he used the word all. All your heart. All your understanding. All your strength. And to love your neighbors as yourself. Which is more important with what? Than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. My dear brethren and friends, being thankful, I'm not saying is wrong. But being just thankful without throwing yourself to God, there is something wrong. We must be beyond thankful. We must be grateful to God. And being grateful to God, I have shown you what a picture of what a man of full of gratefulness looks like. He would remember God because God is the giver of everything. Your work, God provided those things. Your food on the table, God gave all those things. Our clothes, our faces, we all look handsome and pretty. God gave that all to all of us. See, remember the giver. Number two, go beyond remembering. You praise God. You value God. And number three, you go beyond remembering. You go beyond valuing, praising God with your lips. You go and worship God. Worshiping God is throwing yourself to God. Giving yourself in servitude to God. And that is what real gratitude looks like. Now, brethren and friends, God demands gratitude from all of us. It goes beyond thankfulness. And he wants our life, and he wants your life, a life of servitude towards him. And I will leave you all with this final verse from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. As you are, you and I are alive, Paul said, offer now yourself as a living sacrifice. Because if we all die, our body is useless to God. That's why Apostle Paul said, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is, which is your spiritual service of worship. My dear brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. And I call on to those who have not yet accepted the Lord to please come forward. Accept the Lord. Again, I will leave you with the question of our Bible study a while ago. Do you believe in this word? Accept the Lord, repent, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? God bless us all.